So, my allergies are incredibly bad. I have had a nice hot shower and I'm in my comfiest pyjamas for the least stressful bit of this game for the last little while, probably. So yeah, let's jump in. So we kick off by blasting that wall with a spell for no reason, because that's actually going to change the AI pathing further down in this level later on. That's not true, that's a complete lie. Oh, good. In case you haven't uh, been to my streams before, I like to lie. I like to tell things that aren't true. That's also a lie. I don't like to do that. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, I'm a little bit sleepy and out of it due to incredibly bad allergies at the moment, but I believe last time we explored the areas here at the opening of Anor Londo after having crawled through the mud, fought our way through the most horrible, deep places of the earth imaginable, trod on a spider, um, got the sniffles in the swamp, assorted other problems, and hey, this guy looks familiar. <laughs> I like the comic timing of that. So, gargoyles are just as easy to fight as they were in the previous place, except that we don't have the advantage of uh, allies. However, we do have the advantage of the fact that the heavy soul arrow is enough to stagger them on hit. I believe the last lot breathed fire, actually, rather than lightning. That was incredibly lucky that that attack whiffed. Of course, the different elements are associated with different entities in the in the setting. So here in Anor Londo, there's an awful lot of lightning around because as the home of the gods of Anor Londo, appropriately enough, uh, led by Gwyn, the god of the sun, and uh, lightning symbolizes the rays of the sun. Which is an interesting uh, take on things, because usually sun gods are associated with fire, at least in, in fantasy stories and fantasy settings. Sorry about the sniffles, there will be some of those today. Because, as I mentioned... Ooh boy, I've got the allergies. Anyway, uh, yeah, so... There's some interesting sort of ways that's implemented in this world, but... Um, for example, dragons are weak to lightning mechanically in the game because of generational trauma, basically. Um, of the four, you know, great lords who found their their deityhood through the manipulation of the first flame and it's splitting into four lord souls, um, Gwen is kind of the most hegem hegemonic and the most aggressive. Uh, the gods of Anor Londo intentionally set themselves up as the gods of the world. They put themselves in charge of everybody and manipulating the sort of mythic track of existence as it goes. Um, incidentally, this took me... It's, it's kind of dumb considering how explore every corner this game is and how the proper way to play is to explore every nook and cranny, find all the secret things, but... Um, it took me a while to figure out that you could not leap from the end of this bridge onto that uh, apparatus. This gap is obviously way too far to jump, but I could not, I could not figure out where to go. Um, it turns out you're supposed to begin the first of several instances of running up buttresses, which is um, not recommended in terms of workplace safety. It is also not recommended by the ecclesiarchy generally speaking. But you can do it if you want to. These are structural supports, not intended to support human weight, nevertheless. You get in the uh, get in the cathedral this way. Of course, lots of players do leave messages that, hit, that hint that this is the way you go, but um, I guess I got unlucky the first time I reached this area. These guys are pretty easy to parry, I think. Yeah, there we go. I say, immediately before failing to do so. Some of their attacks are very quick, which is uh, why they're hard to parry. Generally speaking, you need to hit the parry button in between the um, attack animations starting to move forwards. So at the moment the wind-up ends and their weapon starts moving forwards, that's when you want to hit the parry button. 
But yeah, so a lot of players die up here because you are expected for some reason to cross the rafters, which is extremely dangerous. Fortunately, we are very agile. We've, we've even upgraded dexterity very slightly, so... These guys will just throw knives at you. Um, I think they have infinite knives, so you kind of have to wait for the AI to decide that it's time to move ahead. But it is pretty risky to actually fight them. And it's pretty easy to bait them into throwing themselves into the void. It is a difficult death to avoid. As I've said before, the bow in this game is less about doing damage to opponents, and really more about manipulating the AI. Um, their pathing is good enough that unless they try to attack... That was lucky. Um, <laughs> the knockback of uh, getting hit in the head is enough to send them plummeting, so that's great for me. Less good for them. But um, yeah, so generally speaking, you just want to ping them once and then get ready to fight them. Uh, you can easily bait them into tripping off of corners, but the main risk is that they will just sit there and throw arrow, uh, throw knives at you forever. Which knocks you back slightly, which is a problem if it happens enough for exactly the reason that it's a problem for these guys to fail to attack me. There we go, that's more like it. So with a bit of luck, he'll uh, hurl himself into the void as well. Nope, well, we can sort that out ourselves. <gasps> oh no! Tragic. The tragic knockback death. It's so satisfying, right? The devs clearly figured something out in Blight Town about how pleasing it is to get NPCs to just throw themselves uh, to their deaths. So, the real trick is uh, filling the rest of the game with guys you can push off things. Anyway, I was talking about the... Uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about the ways that different powers are sort of symbolised in the game world, so... Um, no, I was talking about the generational trauma of dragons, is what I was doing. Basically, uh, Gwyn sets himself up as the, the king god of the gods of Anor Londo, who are a particular kind of entity in the world, you know, what you would call a sort of a fantasy race, but... We're trying to move away from that terminology generally, I think, as a society. But... Um, yeah, their whole deal is that they set themselves up as, as the gods and lord it over humanity forever, which is ironic, considering they were fighting the dragons for exactly the same reason. Um, whether or not the immortal dragons were doing anything before time starts is a good question. I'm personally of the opinion that, um, it's very much, um, you know, the arch trees exist, the dragons exist, but everything is in slumber, everything is in dormant, because... You know, as I said before, you can't have any kind of, um... Okay, well, you're just, you're just playing at silly buggers now, aren't you? What the hell was I talking about? Right, so... Um... You know, then, you know... Where exactly the various peoples come from is anyone's guess, and it's never really explained or gone into, which is fine, because, you know, it's a mythic history of the world. It didn't necessarily literally happen, and if it did, it didn't necessarily happen the way that we're told it happened. But the uh, the four entities, of course, discovered their four different... See, that guy's standing on the platform in the middle, which means that you can't knock back him very easily. The real trick is to figure out the gap in their animation that lets you get a hit in, but... That can be a pain. Bye! So with any luck we'll be able to successfully get this guy as well. I actually think it looks like he pathed a short distance away. That's probably because he heard the arrow land. Um, the arrow that I already fired and missed the other guy. I mean the auto lock on is well, I, I don't use the automatic lock-on, but, like, I toggle it on myself when I need it. But it's quite useful for keeping track of people. It's very effective as a sorcerer, generally speaking. Oh, interesting. That is a rare thing that I hope I can successfully... Okay, fine. I see how it is. I normally just blast these guys with spells. I'm absolutely going to do that next. 
Also, one of the things I said when I started this series was that I was going to be quiet during difficult bits so that I could focus, and I have consistently failed to live up to that uh, intent, tragically. Uh, to my own irritation. I love that you can see other people's lifts uh, are on different timers to your own. I don't know why, but some instinct inside me assumes that um, the lift cycles would all be the same for anybody whose uh, alternative world is um, in orbit of yours. Oh, I see how it is. You, you enjoy seeing me die horribly over and over and over against challenges that should be easily surmountable. I see. This is a... Uh, this is all schadenfreude to you. But yeah, so... Gwyn kind of sets himself up as the chief god, but it's it's less about chief god and more about... Um, or rather, he, present, he sort of present, arranges existence in such a way that he's presented that way always, but... His dominion is light, which is of course oppositional to the dominion of darkness, which is that of the furtive pygmy. So easily forgotten. Forgotten to the point where I have not mentioned it at all. This en entire run so far, I don't think. Um, so, uh, yeah. Every Whenever I talk about this happened or that happened, bear in mind that this is inference and that this is a game intended to be interpreted and which has no objective truth to the sequences of like historical events and mythological events. Um, regardless of what many, many, many YouTubers will try and tell you. There we go. But, um... Light is also time. That's interesting. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Um... Because time seems like it sets itself up as soon as, um... As soon as disparity exists. As soon as you have existence and non-existence. You have an order in which things must have happened. Um, which itself is oppositional to stasis. And of course, there is a whole thing in the Dark Souls games about stasis being being poison, about um, allowing yourself to stop moving forwards being um, as damaging to you as anything else might be. But yeah, so um, Gwyn's aspect is light, the pygmies is darkness. Uh, it is eventually revealed in Dark Souls 3 and sort of you know, fairly reasonably theorised in previous games that uh, the furtive pygmy is the first human and um, all the humans are in some way the offspring of the furtive pygmy. Which means that uh, Gwyn and his brood have really set themselves up to lord it over absolutely everybody else. Nito is, um, you know, very... Um, in a very plutonic style, happy to just chill in the afterlife. He's got his he's got his responsibility, he's going to fulfil it, he's going to do his own thing, and eventually everybody's going to end up in his place anyway, so who really cares about hege hegemonic power structures, you know? Um, we all eventually enter the kingdom of death. So, uh, and similarly, the witches of Isolith were kind of, oh, hi, perfectly happy to do their own thing but um, in primordial times rendered themselves no longer... Oops. Did not mean to use a heavy soul arrow, but it's fine, and I don't know even if I did. Um, uh, they, they rendered themselves, you know, off the game board unintentionally. Although I suppose it was when the flame first started to fade that they um, attempted to recreate the first flame and inadvertently created the flame of chaos. Let's see what this says. Well, shit, it ain't wrong. Ah, well, I very rarely play, um... Well... <sighs> fire... No, the Age of Fire is the age of things existing. It's the age of disparity. Uh, the four different aspects come from the flame. Gwyn's aspect itself is not the aspect of fire. And in fact, um, Sim... Uh, symbolically, fire is much more strongly strongly linked to um, life rather than um, rather than uh, light, because fire is the thing that allows you to differentiate between different states. Um, fire is what allows you to understand that there is light and dark, because without a source for light, you cannot cast a shadow. Um, it is allows, what allows you to understand the difference between life and death and all of these different disparities that the game is, that the, the setting is built on. 
So, yeah, um, time breaking down is really more to do with um, sort of a cosmic, um, cosmological, mystic punishment for, for the breaking of, like, the laws of reality. It is part of the natural life cycle of the universe that it must eventually end and take on a new form, just as the Age of Stasis ended and the Age of Fire began. The Age of Fire needs to end. Um, and implicitly the Age of Dark to be in, and presumably all four of the different entities to, you know, pass through um, their own ages and then presumably back to an Age of Stasis in an endless cycle. Um, all of the weird existential fucked up things about the world in Dark Souls are essentially due to people attempting to break this cycle and um, funny you should mention rest, uh, Mist, I'll, I'll talk about Mist in a minute uh, relatedly, anyway so as we lower this spinning staircase we create a bridge from where we couldn't get previously to over there um, but we're actually going to go down here first and then we're going to go somewhere else but yeah, so um, reality breaking down and time breaking down is because the the universe itself has been prolonged beyond the end of its natural lifespan. That's what Gwyn did by linking the flames. That's what uh, the Witch of Isolith tried to do by um, creating the uh, Flame of Chaos unintentionally. It's just generally a bad idea. Don't break. Don't break cosmological law. Don't um, attempt to. Uh, breach causality or any of these other things. Oh yeah, well, I have, hmm, there's something complicated about the uh, way this game and Dark Souls 3 tie together, which is sort of tied to the development of the series as a whole. Um, but in addition, bear in mind, everything that it says in an item description is something that someone has said to someone else, you know in this world for whatever reasons they have. Like, there's kind of always an ideological uh, extent. And, um, you know, things lie to you, things are confused, things are from people who think they're telling the truth but have a mistaken concept, and so on. Um, alternatively, you might be completely correct. Uh, I'm just some person. Wow, dynamic entry there. What was I talking about? Because I have forgotten completely. Uh, oh yeah, so these various different things. Anyway, um, in treating Dark Souls 1 as a whole work and considering the information in it, it seems pretty clear that that is the, what I have been saying is the way that things are. Uh, in fact, I believe um, I believe someone says to you that um, you know things have been. I think Solaire says that uh, time itself has become sick in some way, broken. But then again, that is if that is due to the ending of the Age of um, Light, then that would be why. Except that they don't say the Age of Light; they say the Age of Fire, and Fire very definitely is one. Uh, is the four quarters of these powers. Light alone is only one quarter of, of, of the four souls that represent fire, which are themselves representative of all of the ways in which things can be different from one another in existence. So that was actually intentional. Um, I've mentioned previously that because you go intangible when you are uh, in a backstab animation, you can actually use a backstab to dodge an attack. Um... One of the rare times when something like that was actually intentional on my part. Additionally, uh, we cut down the chandelier so that we could get this, which is a very useful sorcery that we won't be using. The, adva the, the thing about uh, magic weapons is that... Uh, what the hell was I saying? The thing about magic weapons is that... You, if you enchant your weapon, you don't have to buff it with the magic weapon ability, but the magic weapon, you know, spells increase your damage by a much greater amount than, you know, having the blacksmith upgrade your uh, weapon to be enchanted and do magic damage in exactly the same way. Uh, because we, <laughs> we picked it up because I'm an obsessive who picks up every single item and intentionally seeks out items even those I won't use, such as these, which I will talk about in a moment. Um... I'm a sorcerer, those are too heavy. I will never in invest enough 
um, strength to be able to wield any of those, and yet here I am picking them up anyway, because I'm a weird obsessive who picks up every single item always on every single Dark Souls run. On every file, yeah, usually. Like, um, yeah, I even remember where most of the items in the game are, and I still find myself picking them up compulsively, um, even in Dark Souls 3 and stuff. So this painting is the gateway to one of the DLCs. I will talk about it and what it contains later when we do that DLC, which will show up later. Yeah, it's just kind of, I don't know, it's a collectionist impulse, you know, it's, it's the desire to have everything. So um, the armor on this corpse is um, the armor of Black Iron Tarkas, who helped us fight the golem that got us here to Anor Londo in the first place. So presumably um, in his own instance of this world, because every character you know, you, well, many of the characters you summon in are sort of in other worlds, other instances of the same reality who are on the same quest as you in their version. And that's true. Of, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. As I said, allergies bad today. Um, I really need to have some kind of a mute, um, mute, <laughs> mute hotkey, but I have not figured to set one up yet. So, uh, yeah, every other player is essentially another another version of you, another person in some other instance of reality, some other Kalper, some other time this has happened, who is also doing the same quest. Um, as such, Black Iron Tarkas progresses up to Anor Londo, either because he's on your same quest, or because he's doing his own quest for his own reasons, because many of the NPCs you meet are indeed following the same mythic pathway, but for different reasons. And to be honest, the reasons you are doing it are extremely ambiguous and kind of uh, never really elaborated on. I think the general attitude of uh, the protagon your protagonist when you play Dark Souls is really kind of like, well, I've got nothing else to do, you know. Oh, what's that? Uh, fulfill your fami familial quest? Ugh, I might as well, you know, it gets me out of the house. Oh, what's that? The familial quest actually had two things I had to do? I, I guess I'll do the other one. Oh, okay, that means I get to go to heaven and meet God and become the next king god well that seems rad i'll go do that um you know with no kind of questioning as you go i've just realized why it was important to go do the catacombs and i didn't do the catacombs oh well we'll do them later and come back uh okay i'll explain a kalpa in a second first i just want to say that this is um this statue is of gwyn uh, this is actually an illusion, and if we come back here with a specific ring that we can get in a specific grave in a specific part of the catacombs and wear it, then this illusory wall would disappear. We can't smash it like a normal illusory wall, which is the access way to a secret boss and secret covenant. That is where Gwyndolin is. Gwyndolin I will talk about later on when she's relevant, but for now we're going to continue on through this place. I just wanted to point out that it was there. There's another way to get in there, but I'll explain that a bit later when it's relevant. So, a kalpa is uh, a term from, I think, Hindu mythology, which essentially refers to a vast, vast amount of time likened to the life cycle of the universe itself. So, because everything else lives and dies, the universe also lives and dies and restarts each time. And so, a kalpa is the amount of time it takes for the universe itself to pass through that life cycle and start anew. Um, because I don't have a convenient word for the co for, for a similar concept, I you tend to use it, uh, which may be improper, but I don't really have another word to use. So when I say Kalpa, I mean kind of like another instance of the life cycle of the universe, because everything is in a loop. And uh, the Souls games, and FromSoft in particular, are obsessed with the idea of circularity and, and loops, and this idea that everything comes back around to the same point again, that, that time is a circle. Um, and so this endless cycle of uh, the undead being um, having their souls grown vastly in order to be able to um, fuel the bonfire to prolong this age of existence far beyond its uh, natural lifespan is itself this kind of endless, endless eons long cycle with hundreds or thousands of years between them. Oh, I thought I was at the AOE for that one. So these are, um, I think they're called Brass Giants, or they might be Brass Sentinels, Brass Guardians, something like that. Oh yeah, absolutely.
I suppose there is a little bit of Gnosticism in that there's kind of like, there is no creator deity. Well, I suppose Gnosticism has a creator deity, but the idea that he's fucked off and isn't really doing anything with you, with the universe um, is, is kind of relevant to Dark Souls' cosmology because nobody knows where the universe came from. It just kind of happened one day. Um, and within that context, some entities set themselves up as gods. Which, you know, uh, if you can do, is understandable as a goal. So there's a neat little detail here, which is that um, I previously mentioned that in ages past, it was clearly possible and a lot easier for mortals to ascend here to Anor Londo, this, this world's Olympus, and um, meet their gods before even uh, Sen's Fortress was built so that only those who are worthy could do so. So eons and eons ago, before the rise and fall of many human nations and civilizations in the world, um, this place was clearly shared by both mortals and gods, and we know that the gods are larger in stature. And I personally think that there is a kind of a... To some extent, the larger they are, the more important they are, but um, that was a theory I had many years ago and talked about a great deal in my old Let's Play, which I have actually realised is kind of bunk. Um, it's just that the gods are bigger than humans. That's just how they do. Um... The idea that their sort of mythic importance directly relates to their size is not actually uh, actually held up by the text as we see it. So if you do it right, it's actually possible to knock those guys off the edge just with the knockback of your arrows. But um, it's also useful, as I've said, to manipulate the AI's movement so that you can get them to be up here and fight them up here instead of down there where there's two of them. These guys have really bad poise, which means that you can stagger them pretty easily, but um, they're very dangerous if you... Essentially, if you're a sorcerer, they're dangerous. So it's one of the first times when we're fighting something that is difficult to fight as a sorcerer. Because they move so much, and their hitboxes are really weird shapes. Um, they are quite difficult to actually land a hit on. And uh, they do a lot of damage. Not least because they do um, mixed physical and lightning damage, so as a sorcerer, we don't have much armor, which means that we're weak to physical damage, and uh, elemental damages tend to bypass armor anyway, so, you know. Um, it's bad scene all around. Anyway, these things are these things are called flying demons, I think, which itself is interesting. What are demons doing here? Because demons are distinctly oppositional to the gods. Um, the demons emerged from deep within the earth when the Witches of Isolith fucked up. I mean, I assume they have low poise because they're really flimsy and weak. Like, I don't necessarily think there's a, a deeper truth to it than the fact that they look like they're made of bundles of sticks, you know? Um, I am going to take a break for, like, one minute just to blow my nose because, as I said, bad allergies. So I will be right back. Oh, I literally have a, a Be Right Back panel, and yet I forgot to switch to it. Very professional, me. Um, I assume you might be referring to uh, spoilers, to anyone who hasn't played this game, the fact that these are all illusions, but... Um, I'm not sure if the demons disappear when the illusions are revealed, the way that uh, all of the various giants and stuff do. So I may as well uh, talk about this as we go. Um, Anor Londo itself, is a, as in its current state, is a lie. Uh, time has gone on long enough that everything has kind of broken down and passed away. And um, there is only one god left here in Anor Londo, the... Oh, interesting, I just took a shitload of damage for no reason. So <laughs> the reason why that happened is because there's two NPCs up there who are shooting giant arrows. 
um, there's a weird glitch that I I don't believe happened in Dark Souls Prepare to Die edition, but does happen in the remastered version which we're playing, which is that um, if that arrow hits this this sort of fence, um, previously you would take no damage. Now you take the damage, but not the knockback. I think it's some kind of weird quirk of the way the hitboxes are currently. So, anyway, um, the, uh, the last god of Anor Londo is, uh, poor little Gwendolyn, um, born as a boy, raised as a girl due to, uh, magical association with femininity, the moon, and dark magic. Um, I'm not going to get into the debates about, uh, this character's gender going back and forth. Um... People have been arguing about it for a very long time and I don't care to join in the argument. I'm going to continue using feminine pronouns for her because that seems to be like a reasonable consensus. Hi Maverinthia, welcome to the the this. Welcome to the buttress, the pain buttress, the worst place in the game. Now if I'm incredibly lucky I can get this guy to drop off the edge. But I might just get murdered instead. This one should throw himself off the edge if I come back, but I'm just gonna be quiet for a second because I'm focusing. <laughs> I'm gonna run out of but I'm gonna run out of ledge if I'm not careful. This, this is a bad place to be. This is a bad scene. So I'm probably gonna die here. What I'm gonna try and do next time is get the guy on the left first to drop throw himself off, and then I can parry the guy on the right. But yeah, so um, this is this is one of the points in the game that breaks people. This is one of the most unfair bits of the game. I normally say that Dark Souls is not an unfair game; it is just an unforgiving game. But this is this bit is just absolute bullshit. Um, it's not so difficult to get up the buttress, which is what people usually say that it's a difficult ascent. But um, I would say no; it's just it's difficult to get past the things at the top. There's a few different ways you can do it. Um, one method that people who don't have to be entertaining for an audience like to do is buy poison arrows, then snipe them from very, very far away until uh, they become poisoned and then die of poison damage very slowly over a long period of time, uh, which is bad radio. So I am not in effect going to be waiting for them to simply die of old age and instead will Continue attempting this normally and continue yammering about stuff. If I could remember what the stuff was. Right, so the one deity left in Anor Londo is, uh, is Gwendolyn. So, um, yeah, uh, what we will discover at the end of... Again, uh, for this streaming series, I'm freely talking about spoilers all the way through. This is not a carefully constructed um, Let's Play like my old YouTube Let's Play. Which, anyone who's watching who doesn't know about that should go check out, but I think I think everybody watching currently is somebody I know, so whatever. Um, or at least an old, old-timey fan of my work. Long-term, not old-timey. It's not like you're watching this on your radio in the 1950s, for all that I did just call it bad radio. Fun fact about these guys, um, while they look very intimidating and can do that, it's worth remembering that uh, if you stand inside their shield, you can actually bypass that 100% damage block pretty easily. Anyway, what the hell was I talking about? Gwendolyn, right. So, um, essentially what's happening to the chosen undead uh, and the many chosen undead who occur in sequence, of which you are presumably the first, but which there may be many more later. Um, essentially... There is a great lie, which is that you will uh, take over for Gwyn, that you will fulfill Gwyn's duties. It's very carefully phrased to you to imply that you might be the next king of the gods. Um, but what actually that means is that you will take over as the sacrifice um, whose destruction ensures the continuation of the, uh, the Age of Flame. It's this kind of endless, endless system of... Um, 
you know, throwing throwing lives onto the pyre. But naturally, you know, you have to become strong enough and powerful enough for you to be a worthy enough sacrifice for it to work, which is why we're running around murdering other people as we go to grow our own power, our own personal mythic weight until we are strong enough to be worth burning on the on the uh, pyre of, of, of uh, the Age of Flame. So they didn't hit me that time, which is good. Anyway, um, over the eons that this stuff has been happening, um, this, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. So the reason why this gazebo is difficult is because it's very much in the, um, yeah, I know, um, there's very few characters who are willing to tell you what is going on. Most characters will give you a few cryptic lines and don't really tell you what to do. Um, early on, the people who tell you what's going on and what to do are misinformed. Later, the people who understand what's going on and tell you what to do are actively lying to you for this specific reason, because, well, why would you sacrifice yourself for the continuation of the universe unless you were uh, lied into doing it? And yeah, it's 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 not really a, a climate change metaphor, but you could make that read into it if you if you wanted. I don't think it's intentional, but... I mean, you definitely, you definitely could, because um, the thing is that, like, uh, you know, billionaire oil tycoon profits, you know, throwing society into the fire to continue prolonging those, uh, despite the, you know, coming doom, <laughs> is um, very detrimental to everybody and doesn't really benefit anyone except those billionaires for their own lives, but... Um, there are, you know, it is. There are reasons why you could make a decent argument that it is actually morally correct for you to prolong the Age of Fire because the Age of Darkness is very much framed as an evil thing. It's framed that way by the people who are lying to you to get you to prolong the Age of Fire. Yes, but the person who wants you to bring about the Age of Dark to allow the fire to go out very much is encouraging you to behave in unethical ways. Otherwise. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take that as a compliment, as I believe it is intended. Ha. So I should probably go back to paying attention to what I'm doing, considering that's four, four, three or four instances now where I've died earlier and earlier in this sequence I'm trying to get through. See, when I'm doing a Let's Play, I can just cut my many failures out and only show you the successful one. <clears throat> Although, because, you know, I am an extremely ethical YouTuber, unlike unlike many, I uh, will announce that I have cut out, you know, however many failures or whatever, because, you know, I don't like to give a false impression. Um, when I do something genuinely skillful, you know, you can be like, wow, that was genuinely skillful. You're good at video game, but I'm not going to be, like, tricking you into thinking I'm better than I am. Although, that said, I do want to point out that uh, having to keep talking while playing implements like a 50% skill penalty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, while I enjoy speedruns and especially GDQ, memes like First Try and Oh That Was RNG Manipulation have kind of like become so ubiquitous as to genuinely make it difficult to tell when something actually was a first try or when something actually was, um, you know, uh, RNG manipulation or some kind of clever trick and an intentional death. The obvious cut point is uh, the point at which this halberd intersects my body. Let's see if we can do this properly this time. <laughs> oh, the comic timing. Delightful. You died. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Oh yeah, that's that's funny. Uh, my girlfriend. Our flatmate got my girlfriend into watching Minecraft YouTubers, not not the horrible unethical ones who are popular at the moment, but some other ones. And um, I just found out about that meme like 
a couple weeks ago, so that's fun. Um, what the fuck was I talking about? So, yeah, you are essentially being lied to your whole way through this game and being encouraged to do something stupid. Um, but then the alternative is to do something vicious and cruel. Um, as one might... Well, one could characterize it that way. Essentially, prolonging the existence of the universe because everybody is currently living in it and it's... Well, the universe itself is sick, but the Age of Fire is only an unpleasant time now because it has been prolonged beyond its natural lifespan. It seems like it was a pretty great place to live when it actually was a golden age. So... Yeah, um, the thing about giants is that, like, I think that their role is more about, more that they're kind of a, um, like, the gods are kind of, like, particular entities with particular spheres that they have your power over, you know, just, you know, they're gods, that's how gods do. Um, but the giants themselves, I think, are essentially just a kind of a person, much like, um, much like the humans are. You know, they are, they are, there are many living races in the world, so to say. Um, and, I mean, you could argue that maybe each different uh, one of the four lords kind of created a different race, in which case... Um, oh, that was unfortunate timing. I thought I would get in just before the shield hit me, but fortunately I didn't die this time, so it's going fine. Anyway, um... So I think that they that there were just kind of four kinds of people. There are, of course, the dead, who consist of everybody who's ever died, regardless of what they were in life. Um, humans, who are in some way tied to the Vertic Pygmy. Giants, who are in some way tied to Anor Londo, because, uh, well, there are these giant guardians here, even though they will turn out to be illusions, who exist solely to maintain the lie that Anor Londo is the active home of the gods. Um... But what was I saying? Um, but you know, many other things exist in the world, and demons, of course, sprang from the witches of Isolith, although unintentionally. I believe that the the witches of Isolith and the furtive pygmy were both humans, um, because you know. Quelag's body is on a scale for yours, I believe. So I think maybe they were just humans and giants. I think that they possibly came into existence at around the same time as the flame. I don't think that they were created by gods. I think they just kind of happened. Which has precedent in real mythology, I believe. Um, I think there are some well-known mythologies in the world that have humanity just kind of happen. Um, rather than being made out of mud or wood or whatever. Whatever local, locally sourced materials your deity chose. So, um, yes, we can see that the giants themselves have degenerated somehow over time because we will eventually go back in time several hundred years, which is kind of, I'll talk about it at the time, but there's kind of a fantasy writers have no sense of scale issue with it only being a few hundred years. Um, but the giant blacksmith that we meet shortly has a uh, limited vocabulary and a very specific obsession with just sitting and smithing things forever. Um, whereas Hawkeye Gal has a sort of quote-unquote primitive-ish thing. Uh, well, no, we have no idea what Gwyn's Knights were. Um, we don't know what the Silver Knights consisted of, since we never meet a Silver Knight who isn't an illusion. Um, and the Black Knights themselves, who are the remnants of... The only extant remnants of Gwyn's forces were, of course, um... They are, they're essentially haunted suits of armor at this point in, in their history because, yeah, you see the, ha, can't catch me like that. I'm too smart. Um, so I am just going to cheese these guys because it's a pain in the ass to fight them properly. And I guess that's actually not going to work. So instead it's time for magics. Love a good magics. Fortunately, these guys' hitboxes are big enough that they don't sit very nicely. Uh, so you can get one of them to drop off the edge easily enough. But yeah, so what I think is that the giants are the same kind of people as the gods. I believe that the furtive pygmy was a human, maybe the first human, and that, uh, hi Lisa, uh, that the, the gods themselves were of the giants, and that um, 
maybe some of them naturally gained this power or maybe it was granted to them by Gwyn. It's interesting that um, there is there is a character who is sort of referred to as kind of older and maybe the, the kind of like father of the gods figure and it's not Gwyn. I believe there's one reference to Allfather Lloyd who may have been Gwyn's father. Hey look, this guy's trying the same thing as me. He's at the same point of difficulty. Let's, let's see if he gets hit by an arrow and falls off the edge. <laughs> Love a ghost. Alright, let's see what we can do. So what I need to remember is to break left, get around this column in such a way that I can probably bait this guy into diving off the edge. Um, which won't happen unless I'm lucky, now that I've gotten knocked by the other arrows. Can I get my shield up in time? I Yes, I did. Fantastic. So if he's just going to stand there, I might be able to... Oh no, this is disastrous. This is going to... This is going to hurt. <laughs> so yeah, there are a few different ways to do this. There are cheesy ways to do this and there are non-cheesy ways to do this, but all of them are inconsistent. Generally speaking, uh, the way I do this is that I approach this guy on the left... Um, Run up to him, but don't run past his buttress, and then he will throw himself off the edge, almost always, if you do it right, which I didn't. Um, and then you can fight the other guy normally, especially if you're doing decently at, um... Well, Lloyd is, I believe, referred to as a deity. He, he, has, he has spheres, he has things that he's in charge of. Um, I don't have the coins with me, I can check in the box. Oh no, we find the silver coins later on. One of the coins is dedicated to Old Man McCloyf, who is referred to as the um, god of medicine and drink. So, you know, there definitely are more of these. Yeah, it always it's so weird. Friendly Fire is really rare in this game, but it does exist. I think it's generally... Don't quote me on this, but I think the Friendly Fire is limited to entities that aren't, like, of the same allegiance. So there isn't really Friendly Fire, but NPCs that aren't the same like, from the same faction or whatever, will hurt each other. Uh, and only with, like, big sweeping AoEs. But yeah, so what G what uh, Gwyn's knights actually were is a total mystery. Um, possibly there were two kinds of giants. There were these, like, tall, graceful, elegant giants. Perhaps not. Uh, one theory I have is that it's possible Gwyn's knights were... <clears throat> simply drawn from the ranks of, of, of the gods, you know? If you think about, um, if you think about the, uh, the stories of the Norse deities, they, they make war, they go to war, but they are themselves, you know, they all have their own specific spheres and so on. Um, so perhaps, you know, his legion of a thousand knights are a thousand people of the gods, you know? Um, with their various things. Um, or possibly they were human. Uh, that's also possible because Gwyn very, very intentionally sets himself up as, you know, the god of humanity, the god of the humans. Um, not in terms of a literal sphere, but in terms of who has dominion over whom, he very, very definitely has dominion over humanity. What giants are and how they exist in society is really not gone into because that's not the purpose of it. Um, you know, the story is intentionally ambiguous about all of this stuff because it happened in ancient times and... What's that quote from Lord of the Rings? You know, much that once was is now lost for those who, for none now live who remember it. Um, although I suppose Gwyn's knights do live to remember it, just as crispy, empty suits of armor. Yeah, so if Lloyd is Gwyn's uncle, that implies that Gwyn had a father and a, and a familial system, except Gwyn himself is the king of the gods, you know? Um, or the chief god, which is usually a, which is usually positioned as a, a father, you know, father figure in whatever pantheon it is. At least in popular conceptions of um, ancient polytheisms. Obviously, um, so much is like blurred and confused by pop culture that um, modern conceptions of the ways that ancient religions existed or were practiced or even were thought about by the people who believed in them are often kind of flawed. Uh, but that's not completely my wheelhouse. So, yeah. Um, 
or you know possibly they sort of popped into existence whenever when it was time for gods to exist they popped into existence with the kind of relationships gods have with one another <laughs> um All of which is a tangent from what I was talking about, which is that um, the only deity left in Anor Londo is the deity of magic and darkness and the moon. Uh, poor little Gwendolyn, all alone and lonely, who sits forever next to the empty grave, the symbolic grave of her father, the uh, Lord of the Gods, Gwyn. Oh, for fuck's sake! I think in my old um, Let's Play of this, it took me about 15 attempts to get up here, which naturally I cut out. <laughs> um, although when I was playing this a couple weeks ago, playing through my own personal save, I think I managed it on two tries, but I got really lucky on my first sprint up. The, the Silver Knight just threw himself off the edge immediately. So um, one of the things associated with the moon is kind of like tricksy magic, and part of that is illusions. So, um, there's a couple of reasons why uh, Gwendolyn will have filled Anor Londo with many, many illusions of various things. One is that it is very important to keep up appearances, because the whole way through the game you're told, you know, you're, you're going to ascend to the home of the gods and see where the gods are and become what ranked amongst their number. And the framing of the cutscene when you enter this area is very intentional. It's this, it's this moment of awe and glory where you, you you pop up behind this grim stone wall and you see this vast marble metropolis bathing in sunset sunlight. And it's this, this moment of warmth and glory, but also kind of an austere sterility. This place inviolable, uncorrupted by the woes of the world. And, um, yeah, then you start to look around and it, hey, doesn't it seem kind of empty? Heaven is, heaven is empty. It's cleared out. The gods have all fucked off. So, yeah, partly is that's because it's important to keep up appearances because it's important that the chosen undead arrive and uh, think, yeah, this, this looks like Olympus. This looks like heaven. This looks pretty correct for what it's supposed to be in my conception of the universe and my conception of what is going to happen to me when I'm here. And... Um, if you showed up and it was all dark and empty and there was nobody here whatsoever, you'd just be like, well, something's wrong. You know, something is clearly wrong. But... Um, yeah, the other reason, personally, I think, is just that it would be very lonely. I think that it is intentional that... Um, well, if heaven got gentrified, there'd be somebody else living here rather than the one last remaining of the original inhabitants. Um, also, gentrification is what happens to a place that is without wealth and power, uh, when wealth and power decides that it wants it, so... Um, it's kind of backwards. Maybe they gentrified somewhere else and that's why they're not here. Also, it's astonishing to say the rent might be too high because... I think we can all agree that these guys are the landlords. What are the gods, if not the landlords of existence? Regardless, um... This might get me attacked. Yeah, there we go. I have fucked up. Oh, I know what might work, actually. I don't- well, I don't need to fight these guys at all, what am I doing? I got hit by an umbrella again. The mighty parasol archers of Anor Londo feared the world over. Because they can't fit into these buttress passageways, so I can just run past them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't need to have been fighting these this entire time. But yeah, so um, I, I just think that Gwendolyn must be lonely. You know, it's probably a pretty uh, lonely place to be. All things considered. Oh, balls. Straight up, I'm not sure how I'm going to get through this. Maybe I'll go back down to the world of mortals and go get uh, 
go do the catacombs or something and then come back later. Can I even cast Soul Spear yet? What's my intelligence? 31. Yeah, if I got five more levels I could cast Soul Spear, which might do enough damage through the shield to stagger them a bit. Oh boy, oh boy. This whole episode is just going to be, be me trying and failing to get up this fucking buttress, I swear to god. Um, or Gwyn, I guess. Uh, what the hell was I talking about? Right, so, um, yeah, uh, and in fact, if you, when you get through this area, you find what you think is the last remaining deity in Anorlondo, Guinevere, daughter of Gwyn, and this, this kind of, like, intentionally exaggerated, iconic feminine figure, um, and I mean iconic in the, like, kind of actual sense of the word, not as in, like, wow, iconic, I mean, like, an icon. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, she tells you the truth about what's happening and your your mythic destiny and how you are the chosen one who is going to ascend to Gwyn's place in the world. And, um, can, oh shit, this, I thought this was the wicket gate that was open, but it's the full thing. Okay, I need to, I need to get a wiggle on then so that he doesn't chase after me. These can't chase me down here, and the ones down here can't chase me to the buttress, so... I could have just been running past all of these every time I've done this. I always forget that running past enemies you don't need to fight is a Dark Souls mainstay. <laughs> like, if I'm dying every time I'm losing all the souls anyway, so why bother? Haha, -ha, I'm a genius, I say, having forgotten to rest and heal on the buttress. Basically what you want to do is get close enough to this guy that he draws his sword and then stand here and he'll do that. The difficulty is doing that without getting killed by that guy. So, yeah. Um, you work your way through Anor Londo and you find this this um, figure of divine provenance and uh, she tells you, you know, you're, you are the chosen one. Uh, your whole deal is that you are going to take Gwyn's place. And even that is phrased quite carefully, you know? You're taking Gwyn's place, and you think, well, Gwyn's the king of the gods. I, I'd like to be the king of the gods. That sounds like a cushy deal. Um, but no. You are, in fact, taking Gwyn's place as the uh, sacrifice by which the nature of existence is maintained. So, yeah, when you find that illusion... It's, it's kind of cleverly done. On your first run through the game, unless you've been spoiled on it, um, you kind of take everything at face value. There is, this, there is this aspect of the game where all of these lies are told to you in careful ways that aren't really lying, but it's careful omissions of the truth, careful obfuscations and confusions. Um, and you have no reason not to trust because you've played a video game before. You know, you've been, you've been the chosen one a hundred times. So why would you mistrust this time? Especially considering the gauntlet it puts you through before this this area, you know, you've you've fought through the worst parts of the world, through a lake of horrible filth. You've fought demons, you've fought undead, you've fought monsters, you've worked your way through and you claw your, set, claw your way up here to the home of the gods. And then you meet the gods and they tell you, welcome, congratulations, you get to be one of us now. And that narrative arc is such a, an understandable thing to kind of the, the human brain and our understanding of stories and so on. So you just, you just take it at face value. Uh, and it's not until the very end of the game that you start to suspect, like, hmm, hmm, I, I don't quite see why the game ended the way it did. Curious, I wonder what that might mean. And, um... Hmm. If I could get him to step forwards, I might, can, can the other guy hit me from here? Or can I just blast this guy with arrows? Well, apparently I can't blast him with spells, but it sounds like the other guy can't hit me right now, so... Yes! Okay, fantastic. Okay, that's step one. And now I have to kill the other one. Because I do have to kill the other one because there's an item, and as I said, I'm a weird obsessive who collects every item on every playthrough. I believe that is a hero soul over there, which I would like. Sir, do you mind not doing that, please? Just for a moment, thank you. There we go. 
So I headed backwards. Um, my damn ass failed rem to remember that the trick is to go right first because the other guy can't hit you because the fucking buttress is in the way. Because he's standing down there, and that that buttress will block his shots if you turn if you turn right and sprint at the other guy. And if you get close enough, he pulls out his sword. It's so easy. Oh my god. But yeah, so this is one of the most unforgiving and unfair parts of the game because you just kind of have to luck into knowing that. <laughs> I did it. Boss? Nope, no boss here. So yeah, the game is structured in such a way to encourage you to believe the things you're told as you start to piece truths together that may not be entirely the whole truth and um as you pass on through this through this place you 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 come to believe that but here's the thing if for some reason you decide to shoot an arrow at that goddess she disappears and is revealed to be an illusion and then you get a strict telling off um because that is an illusion created by Gwendolyn, an illusion of her sister in order to impart information to the chosen undead, in order to manipulate them into doing what they need to do, and um, you are you are told that this is a sin for you have you have sinned against uh, this place, the realm of the gods, and uh, that sucks, and you shouldn't do it, basically, and you get in trouble, and um, that's that's the end for you, really. Hi, Bina. Welcome. Um, and at that point, uh, you can be invaded by a specific covenant whose job it is to invade people who do that terrible thing. So last time I fought through this area, I actually had a really easy time parrying these. I just focused on parrying them. Um, but I had been playing more of a parry build the whole way through that time. You can actually parry that spin attack if you time it right. I'm just out of practice at parrying. There we go. Yes, that's the other thing. Um... With the dispelling of that illusion, you've shown that you're not going to be fooled, so um, Gwendolyn dispels all of the rest of the illusions. And Orlando is not this beautiful, sun-drenched, sunset kingdom, but is in fact dark, cold, and empty. All of the various silver knights and brass, uh, brass giants all disappear. Yeah, basically. Um, and you are left with this empty, cold place. And that is one of the ways of opening the boss fight with Gwendolyn, who is the secret boss at the end of this area. And also... Hello, girl like substance. Nice to see you. Um, have it, you two having just shown up now is convenient, because that means you didn't watch me die on the buttress 15 times uh, before eventually rediscovering that it's super easy if you just go right instead of left. I am not hollow. Boy, I'm pretty close. Yeah, so we'll talk to Solaire now since oh, he's here. There you are. You've been quiet these days. Mood summoning out there. Anytime you see my brilliant or shining signature, do not hesitate to call upon me. You left me with quite an impression. I would relish a chance to assist you. You really are fond of chatting with me, aren't you? If I didn't know better, I'd think you had feelings for me. Oh no, do it. Pretend you didn't hear that. <laughs> so, perhaps unintentionally, Solaire is actually canonically bisexual because he says that line which implies that he's uh, thinking of you in a romantic way or um, is pleased that you're thinking of him in a romantic way. Uh, he says that regardless of your gender, if I remember correctly. You really are fond of if I didn't know better. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all of his dialogue here. Um, he has made it to... The home of the gods. Has he found his son? S-U-N? Well, perhaps not. Anyway, let's see if I can get the parry timings back for these guys. I, I had an instinct for it previously. Also, if you time it right, you can uh, ch uh, chain straight into a backstab, which is always nice. So even once you get inside uh, this area, you sort of still can see that there are these mysterious emptinesses. 
But the other thing about uh, whether the gods are giants or humans or other things is that, um, well, this whole area is built scale to humans. These are human-sized doors. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I mentioned that you could tell very clearly that um, at one point mortals and the gods lived side by side in Anor Londo. Um, and you can tell this by the fact that, you know, there are giant doors and human scale doors. There are giant steps and human scale steps. Yeah, the second hit is easier in the two thrust stab, I think. But, um, yeah, so... By the way, I've mentioned this previously, but whenever there's an illusory wall, not, usually there is a hint. So you can see through this window that there is a staircase here and there's no door to get in. Um, whenever there's something like that, that is a hint that there's an illusory wall. And there are usually these hints. So we come over here and we bust it open. Generally speaking, when you're playing through a Souls game, if you think to yourself, hmm, that doesn't seem quite right, surely there should be something here. Generally speaking, nine times out of ten there is, whether that's a shortcut or a drop down, um, or a uh, illusory wall. Motherfucker, I can't believe I fell for it. But up, up, but up, up. That's Dark Souls, baby. So yeah, um, <laughs> I knew there was a, I knew there was a mimic in that room, but I thought it was the one at the other end. I know, right? All of my, all of my bullshit about how I'm great at this game, and I remember where every trap and every, every item are, you know. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, anyway, I got yum yum yummed, so there we go. Of course, I suppose the difference is that when I was playing this previously, I was obsessively playing it for like six hours a day, I think, you know, a few weeks ago when I was, when I was really into it again. Um, I was playing it for like five, six hours a day, so it's understandable that my skills will have rusted a bit and I can cut myself a little bit of slack. Yeah, it super feels like a room you're going to be ambushed in rather than a room that you're going to allow yourself to be devoured in, I guess. See, there was even a there was even a, a warning in front. And of course, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but there's a little trick you can tell. Uh, mimic chests always have a chain that curls forwards, whereas real chests always have a, uh, a chain that curls backwards. So, um, however you feel about uh, magical animated chest monster prescriptivism, um, it does not change the fact that you can always find mimics through that useful trick. Um, of course the alternative is that you can just hit them, because um, I think on my first run through the game I kept forgetting to check if the chain curls forwards or backwards, and instead simply uh, just hit every single chest with a melee attack. In Dark Souls 2, in Dark Souls 2 you can't do that safely because uh, you can smash a chest and it will, you'll lose the item in it. So, so uh, don't get into that habit. Although I believe that's a mechanic only in Dark Souls 2. Oof, I think that was the spin kick. Nasty. So you actually can break out of holds, which I think I mentioned last stream, which I didn't know until very recently. Um, but these guys do so much damage that uh, I couldn't break out of the hole before he killed me. I love the laughter. Straight up, I really like their sort of horrible, cackly, honky laughter. It's it's so strange, but I really like it. It's really menacing. Oh, don't say that, you might start a fight. Um, I really like Dark Souls 2, but I only played it once. Every other Dark Souls game I've obsessively played, like, you know, ten times each. Dark Souls 2, I've only ever played once. Uh, I'm actually thinking of, um... It won't be my next, like, main streaming game, but, um... Soon-ish I will be streaming Dark Souls 2. Not least because it is pretty much the only way I can blind play through a Dark Souls game at this point, or at least a, a FromSoft game. You know, I've completed, um... I've completed Sekiro several times, I've completed Dark Souls 1 like 10 times, I've completed Dark Souls 3 like 5 or 6 times, but Dark Souls 2 only once and like 7 years ago, so it's not like I can remember what happens. So 
So because of that, I am thinking about that as air. P putting it on the list for streaming, you know, along with... Um... <sighs> I hate that these guys are tall enough that my soul arrows go between their legs. If I had my nice bleed dagger, I would... Um... I would just rely on that to kill them and just melee them over and over and over because it's actually safer uh, at this sort of stage. Well, I mean, the benefit of doing backstabs is that you can get a shitload of, of um, damage on an enemy and lock them into an animation, which is useful. Um, Of course, if you hit them enough, you can stagger them pretty easily. Um, a bit like those demons, except not really like them at all, so take what I say with a grain of salt. I just got a very confused expression from my partner from the other side of the room. But yeah, so let's take a look at these coins now that I've found them since I mentioned them earlier. So the silver coin. Legendary Night King Rendell on its face. So some of the some of the coins clearly don't they, like they don't all represent gods, and there's no reason to think they're all from the same kingdom anyway. All Father Lloyd. Yeah, it doesn't say anything further about him here. It just says it's of All Father Lloyd and his wife Halo. I think All Father Lloyd is referred to as somewhere else as being the uh, the patriarch of the the church. That worships Gwyn, maybe. Um, the Way of White. Well, I kind of feel like the mimics. Um, I don't know if the mimics disappear if you if you don't aggro them before you kill Gwyndolin. So if the mimics are still here, that would make sense, especially considering in the dark underground treasure vault, the hidden one behind an illusory wall, where we find uh, the armor of Havel, who I must remember to go back and kill at some point because. Um, well, he deserves to die. Um, so, uh, there's a ton of these guys around here. As you can see, I aggroed some through a wall accidentally. But yeah, so um, that club is uh, enchanted with occult damage, which is um, the damage type that the entities of Anor Londo are weak to. Which makes sense. It makes sense that the, the entities of Anor Londo would be weak to um, to the element associated with darkness, which is occult. Um, because they are oppositional, much like uh, life and death are oppositional. Although, that logic absolutely does not hold, because um, a blessed item is, is detrimental to death, and uh, blessings are associated with at least the, the priests of the Way of White, if nothing else. Is there a guy in here? I can never remember which rooms have silver knights in. <clears throat> that statement gets more complicated when you consider that the goth is a god. But yeah, so here we have human scale beds in a human scale bedroom and human scale portraits, mostly of humans, presumably. Or maybe they're all of gods, because this, of course... It's Guinevere, who we'll go, going, we're going to meet in a bit, and as I have pointed out, does not really exist. There's, there's going to be a lot of that sort of thing. So there's a guy directly around this corner. With a bit of luck, we can parry him without much trouble. Arguably, the paintings are important to the lore. You can draw a lot of conclusions from them, but I believe that they have done the common trick game designers pull of using um, either sort of I think there are like stock Renaissance portraits that are, are used and I believe these are real Renaissance portraits that are kind of a stock portfolio of portraits that are used uh, in in video games a lot. Um, this is just a, a landscape. Again, I'm not sure about these. I think this I think this is a digital painting. but um, yeah, I believe that they have done the trick mini game designers pull of repurposing concept art for the game as artworks within the game, which I talk about lengthily in my um, 
uh, Dishonored Let's Play, which is really good, and if you haven't checked it out on YouTube, you should go check it out. Uh, yeah. uh, always early on that. The advantage of these guys being so backstabbable is that you can, you know, chug a log when you need to. There's not much of a gap between the, the swing starting and the uh, weapon hitting you, which is why it's difficult. It should do enough damage through his shield to kill him, but... <laughs> it's always fun to catch people when they do weapon switching. So, when we were on that little balcony down, down below, just down there, we could see... I see. I didn't quite get my shield up in time. Anyway, on that balcony we can see through a window and that there is our good buddy Sieg... Maya? There's a Sieg in every single one of these games, and I can never keep track of which one's which. Sieg Ward, Sieg Maya, Sieg... Sieg Lindy? Sieg... Um, Sieg someone else. So, I'm not sure which one's which. I think it's Sieg Maya of Katarina who's in this one, so... That thrust's a lot easier to parry than the other ones are. Um, yeah, so we can see him through a window, so we're gonna go rescue him in a minute. Yes, the good onion. Uh, Siegmeier, Sieg, <laughs> Siegmeier of Katal Katarina, the onion knight, sworn to the Lady of Shalott. That's a very funny pun, if you know. Uh, if you know your vegetable genuses. Not even genuses, but like, what's that? What's the thing? Like, families of vegetables? I don't know. Don't pity me. <laughs> I don't need your pity praise. You know, these guys, for illusions, they hit pretty hard. Oh, I'm sorry for- I'm sorry for being irony poisoned by the internet. Um, I actually really like Gwendolyn as a boss fight. I think she's a very fun boss fight. Uh, but she's not very difficult, which is also pleasing. You know, it's nice to have an easy fight. She'd be Onion Daughter, right? Because she's Sieg- Siegmeier's daughter. Who is, I believe, the Sieglindi that I mentioned already. With a bit of luck, we should actually meet Sieglindi on this playthrough, unless I have screwed up entirely. So after we rescue him here, he moves back down to uh, Blight Town. Well, he moves to Firelink Shrine and then to Blight Town. And um, after Blight Town, he goes somewhere else to the Demon Ruins, I believe. No, Katarina is the is the kingdom that they're from. Uh, Siegmeier of Katarina is is his title, and Sieglindi of Katarina is uh, hers appropriately. I mean, I guess you're right. Like, you can't you can't stop me from going around adopting NPCs willy nilly. You know, that was a badly timed drink. But yeah, so that actually illustrates a point I've talked about previously, which is the difficulty it, of, in finding a lot of the uh, plot lines in the game. There's a lot of these, these characters who return to places that you have no reason to return to. Ooh, very nice. Let's have a look at that. So we got lucky with a drop here. Silver Knight Straight Sword. Uh, whoops. Silver Knights of Anor Londo guard the city with this slender weapon. Its chain attacks, blah, 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 blah. That's not interesting, actually. Yeah, she's called Sieglindy. I, like, I'm not... <laughs> I know that sometimes I lie as a joke because it's funny, but I do usually say so immediately afterwards. But yeah, so you don't really ever have a reason to go back down to that area of the game. Um... Unless you know that there is a bonus zone there, which you which you have not completed. If you've already completed that zone, you never have a reason to go back down there. Or if you don't know that there's a bonus zone hidden in the, the lake at the bottom of Blight Town, then you also have no reason to go back down there. Um, I suppose 
technically you can pass through that area again heading down to go do the demon ruins area but by the time you go to do the demon ruins you always have unlocked bonfire warping which means you can teleport straight past um so you kind of just have to be pointlessly exploring or know that that's where he goes next in order to find him because what he says to you is that he's going to go below So if he says that he's going to go below, it's reasonable for you to assume that he's going to be in the next like underground region you visit, which at that point is usually going to be New Londo. Which is not only underground, it's directly under where he's standing at the point he says it. So I know that on my first run through the game, I assumed that he meant he was going to go to New Londo and that I would meet him down there. Uh, and that's not the case. He goes to the uh, he goes to the swamp at the bottom of Blight Town. This is quite a trip. You need another three no, maybe five bottles. Hmm. Quite a fix indeed. Oh, don't worry. I am five bodies. Charmer ahead. I mean, they're not wrong. So yeah, there's basically three silver knights in this room, which we can usually bait out with the bow, which as I said before, as I say every time I use it is mostly for moving NPCs around <laughs> rather than uh, actually damaging them. I keep saying NPCs and enemies interchangeably in this game, but um, I should probably not be like that. Yeah, he must have fought several knights to get this far. However, all of the knights that you fight up until this point, you you can bait into fighting one by one. This guy has no bow. Like, he, he doesn't have any kind of ranged attack, so he can't bait them out and fight them like I'm doing. So, you know, uh, he's presumably been fighting them one at a time up until this point and doesn't fancy fighting several at once. I mean, neither do I, which is why I'm baiting them out here one at a time. And then backstabbing them forever. I do like the idea of him sort of hacking his way through um, and just being like, today the onion chops you. Actually, I should fight this guy a bit further away so that I don't accidentally hit him. Come on, there we go, let's, let's be done. Let's be having you. Thank you. I guess he could throw chairs at them. So people think of him as a great, this is, this is actually what's going on. Um, it's just that he's not very good at what he's doing. Like, nobody wants to believe this. Everybody thinks that he is a mighty knight and a, a sort of a great hero, but he's not. His whole character arc is about how he feels insecure and invalidated about his desire to be this kind of, like, noble hero knight who rescues people, and how he can never achieve that. He's always He always gets into trouble and is rescued by other people, which is the opposite of what he wants to be. He wants to be someone who helps people, not someone who is, in his eyes, pathetic and needs help. Like a lot of these character arcs in Dark Souls, it's kind of about people um, confronting their own um, inability to achieve whatever it is that they're, you know, obsessively searching for in the world. Because the first time you meet him, um, he's trapped and he's saying... Where, hang on, where do you first... No, the first time you meet him, he's he's run up against a, a challenge he can't overcome. He can't figure out how to open the gateway to Sen's fortress. Um, you know, the second time you meet him is... Is this the second time you meet him? I can't remember if there's another one in between. Um, but yeah, here again you meet him and he's he's trapped. He can't progress any further. He can't figure it out. He wants you to stop and wait with him and just sit here and not make progress. Um, because he's ultimately afraid. He doesn't feel like he can get through it. Oh, the pick with the giant. That's, that's what I mentioned about reusing concept art for the game as artworks within the game world. That is actually, that definitely is concept art from the game. Um, as you can see, that giant is about twice as big in scale to that human as the ones in the game actually are. Um, you can draw conclusions about what that means for the nature of this world, but it's... Um, 
you know, it, it's that way because they, they made that art before they put them in the game and they hadn't decided how big they were going to be. Um, I don't believe the rest of these are particularly interesting. These are just paintings of Anor Londo. But yeah, so um, Siegmeier's whole arc is about this, this kind of difficulties he has. You know, he, he comes here and he gets stuck and then you solve his problem. He's like, he's decided that the problem is insurmountable to him. He cannot face it alone. He needs three, no, five more people. Oh, hang on. I thought this was the way down. Oh, no, I know where I need to go now. Um, so I'm not going to fight that, but I just want to point out that there is a, a titanite demon trapped in here. Oh, hi. Hey, this isn't uh, the bathroom. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave. I'm just gonna leave. Bye. Ah, see, as I said, you can actually parry the spin attack. Um, I feel guilty intentionally attacking this guy, but you know, the trick is to bait people into attacking, uh, bait people into attacking you, and then murder them. Try locking on. Supposedly you can hit that guy from here, but I don't think it's really true. You can lock on, but can you actually- <gasps> Oh, you can! Oh, well, okay. I just found a cheese method. Well, see that- the guy who was standing there doesn't actually guard an item, because I can, um... There's one over there, and you can grab that without him actually being a problem. I'm sure I tried this on my last run through here and it did not work whatsoever. Um, this is actually one of the toughest Titanite demons to fight in the game because you have to fight this incredibly large guy in this incredibly small room. His attacks fill the room and if he hits you, even if you're playing an armor build, he'll probably knock off half to a third of your health in one hit. Um, but you know, you can always do this instead. I don't believe the remaster changed that much. I, I don't believe it's mechanically any different because I've looked up, I've tried to look up, you know, changes and stuff and I believe that it is mechanically the same and also when I said the last time I came through here I meant the last time I was playing Remastered which was like two weeks ago. Uh, so where do I need to go? Okay I know where I need to go. Wait where does this staircase go? It's not the one we came up is it? Oh, it is. I, I'm done. I, uh, empty-headed. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm, that's what I was saying. Um, but yeah, so normally what I, I do is I bust open that door down there and then, um, try and get it from the, the angle, but it's really difficult. You know, you can run into the room, blast it and run out again, but that's lengthy and difficult. Anyway, so, um, poor Onion Knight. He gets stuck and you rescue him. He gets stuck and you rescue him. He decides that five people would be needed to bust through this area, but then you do it by yourself. And if you talk to him again, he is kind of like, well, fuck. <laughs> In fact, I should do that now because he does give us an item. Got to get that item. Um, and then, yeah. So yeah, we're never going to use that. See, he's slightly snippy that you went and solved the problem without him. Um, but if you wait with him, he'll just sit there forever and never do anything. So the next time we find him, it's in Blight Town, and he's um, very much got stuck again and he needs he needs healing items and you give him some you give him some healing moss and he's like well you've saved my bacon again uh i can't thank you enough bye and then he then he goes and um then the time you meet him after that he's basically put himself in a position where he's stuck again and then he declares that the only thing he can do to help you the only thing he can do to make his life meaningful is to go fight a whole bunch of monsters in a hole um, which which is a suicidal act, ultimately. Um, he, he's throwing himself at a challenge he knows he can't overcome because he's devoted his life to becoming 
this this noble knight who overcomes the challenge and saves the day, and yet he can't do anything, and every time he gets stuck, and then you show up and you get him out of trouble, and it's not even it's not even him who did it, and he can't live with that. If he survives that encounter on more than fifty percent health, um, he essentially loses the will to uh, it, on less than fifty percent health. He loses the will to live and dies immediately. Um, if he survives it on a hundred percent health. You can reunite him with his daughter and basically they have this sort of conversation where it's like um dad for fuck's sake please come home come back home and just be normal stop trying to be like a crusading hero you know just just come home and be a guy okay like we love you please come home and um yeah that's that's the end of that's like the good end of his storyline but it's really difficult to achieve because uh you know, he, in the middle of his conversation, dives into... Ooh, this is risky. Yeah, no, damage through the shield. Um, I got overconfident again. But that's fine. We've, we've opened a shortcut. It's, it's not too much trouble to get back here. And it doesn't hurt to have a bit of a refresh on spells and stuff. So... Um, what eventually happens at that point is this kind of situation where he's really difficult to save. Um, and if you save him, he's like, you're right, I'm not cut out for this. I This was a foolish dream. I was stupid to think that I could make a difference. And then he just goes home. Well, he reunites with his daughter. But, um... That's what I mean when I say his entire character arc is built around his inadequacy and his difficulty at facing his own inadequacy. Um, he has a very clear image of what he wants to be and who he wants to be and what he wants to do, and he cannot live up to it, no matter how hard he tries. And he either dies pointlessly in the trying of it, or... I think I aggroed that guy. Are we cool? <laughs> You know when your eyes meet with someone across a room and you're like, are we going to fight? But they're cool and it's fine and you don't have to fight them. That's what just happened. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's why ultimately him going home is the good ending, even though it is like this kind of like semi-tragic thing for him as a as like a person. Um, but... Um, it's very difficult to achieve that ending, because even if you do get to that final fight with him, even if you do manage to pull all the way through the game and reach that point, uh, you very much have trouble trouble doing that, because he dives into a poisonous hole full of demons, and uh, even if you manage to kill the demons, he might have taken, up, taken enough damage from the poison that he's uh, past that point of stuff. And if you kill the demons before he dives in the hole, um, it breaks his heart, and he just kind of leaves. Um, and I believe that's the end of his questline. He's just like, I guess I am kind of completely pointless and, in and inadequate. This should damage him through his shield enough to kill him. There we go. I was worried I got close enough to that, um, tower that the, the guy would come out, but I did not. It was fine. Oh really? Um, I th that might. I think that's what happens if you kill the demons before he goes in. Have I misremembered the end of that story completely? I'm sure that he he reunites with Sieglindy in a positive way if you get him through that encounter with more than fifty percent health remaining. I think. Oh, I'm gonna have to look that up now. Or one of you guys can look it up and tell me. I'm really not sure. Because I think, I think there's two ways the story can go once you get to Ash Lake. Um, I think. I think I'm right about that. I should be able to just blast this guy along the corridor like this. Ooh, okay. Not being able to dodge cancel out of um, spell animations is really, really difficult. Um...
Yeah, Greater Soul Arrow is actually actually perfect for this situation. Sorry, I missed your uh, missed your message. I think it's. Um, I'm not actually sure. I don't know what happens if you kill all but one of the demons. I think he might dive in when you start killing them. Um, but yeah, uh, Greater Soul Arrow is kind of useful for situations where people can't get at you and at no other point because its casting animation is so long, uh, and because you can't dodge cancel out of um, out of those animations, uh, it's super dangerous. Right, so this is a shortcut that will be useful for the next section. Uh, but yeah, so if you can fire over a balcony or off a cliff or at someone who hasn't noticed you yet, it, yeah, it's great. It makes a great opener for a fight, um, especially considering a lot of enemies will just die in one hit from it. Where what are we looking at now? Uh, right, so this is the main hall of Anor Londo. It's actually up here is where I very is where I found my very first um, vagrant in the original Dark Souls. The only time I ever saw a vagrant in. Um, in whatever the fuck it's called, uh, Prepare to Die edition. So for anyone who doesn't know, vagrants are these weird multiplayer entities. Um, there's a lot of these passive multiplayer components in Dark Souls. It kind of pioneered them to a great extent. Seeing other players, the shadows of them moving around, doing things in their own worlds Im imperceptibly um, and all of that kind of thing. Vagrants are what happens if someone drops a bunch of items. They sort of glom together and come to life and become an entity in your world that runs around. We saw one earlier when I was crossing the rafters, and but unfortunately I got knocked off and died. Um, and if you kill it, you get the items that it contains. So here's like the realist dude in Anor Londo. And uh, he's got his thing he's doing and he's chill and it's fine. The blacksmith of the gods, not himself a deity. In fact, it's heavily implied that the giants of Anor Londo are in fact slaves. Um, those, the ones who work in Sen's fortress and this guy here are, are actually not free individuals. So I wanted to, uh, if I get this to dagger to plus 10, I should now be able to modify it into a lightning dagger, which is going to be very useful as we go through the game. We'll probably uh, strip the enchantment off it and turn it into an enchanted dagger a bit later, but for now, lightning dagger is going to be the way to go. Um, as you can see, the scaling at the bottom of the screen will be uh, removed completely. So when you get a uh, elemental enchantment on your weapon, most of them remove the scaling entirely. The benefit is that um, the physical damage is decreased because you no longer have the scaling contributing damage from your stats, Instead, you gain um, you gain a large amount of elemental damage. Uh, unless you have a really good scaling weapon, or it's later in the game and you've boosted your stats a whole bunch, the damage improvement is usually going to be better from enchanting something with elements. Uh, but of course, you have the downside that if you're fighting something resistant to that element, then it, it won't be as effective. Lightning is a generally useful enchant to have. Um, and of course, as you can see, that's going to nearly double my damage output. I'm going to go from 100 plus 21 to... Uh, sorry, I'm going to go from 112 to 200. Uh, where 100 is physical and 100 is lightning. So it's a good thing to have. We're not going to reinforce any armor, because there's only one light armor set in the game worth wearing, really, and uh, we won't have it for a while, and I don't... I can't be bothered to put points in endurance that I don't need to, because I want to boost my magic. The trade-off is, of course, higher endurance means better armor, means lasting longer in a fight, means more stamina, means more lasting longer in a fight, but, you know, if you boost your damage, you kill things faster, so you don't need to last as long in a fight. That is the sorcerer way. Overwhelming force, instantaneously, with the opening move. Your opponent cannot hurt you if you have projected your ego into their mind and destroyed them utterly. Yeah, I mean, the one downside of playing a sorcerer is that I don't get to fuck about with uh, fashion souls, which is a huge shame because the armor sets in the game are delightful and quite beautiful. The brass armor of the giant sentinels of Anor Londo. This is the armor set that was used as part of the giant dad. Um, 
uh, multiplayer meta that I, I talked about previously. I'm not going to buy any of these right now because I want to go level up my souls. But before we do that, I want to open the main door. See, that's his whole deal. That's all he wants to do is just forge stuff. See, I will put uh, I will put on a ring to wear a nicer hat. I don't usually level up to wear a nicer hat. Can I get the... There's a secret chest hidden here in the corner that a lot of people miss. So... Oh no, I can't get back out. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll tidy it up, I promise. Um... So there's another shortcut here, actually, that I'm going to open before we move on. So yeah, the uh, the giant blacksmith here, he's got that ring next to him. What we will find out later is that... Uh, well, what we can find out immediately is that it is the ring of one of the four knights of Gwyn. It is the ring, I believe, of Hawkeye Gao. Hawkeye Gao, Gao is actually meetable in the DLC... Uh, well, the, the Ulusil DLC. Oh, two, of course, in this game. Um, and it turns out that one of the f one of the four knights of Gwyn is a giant. Um, and the others seem to be of that sort of larger than reality... R larger than is natural proto-human race from which the gods themselves are drawn. It's unclear if all of those people are gods, and it might be that, you know, the silver knights themselves are of that people, as we were discussing earlier. Um, but it's all it's all mysterious and, and ambiguous because that's what Dark Souls is supposed to be as the director himself said there is no truth there is <laughs> the goal of our design was to create these evocative ambiguities and encourage players to come up with their own explanations there is no there is no gospel platonic truth Uh, yeah, it could be Gao or it could be Goch. It also could be um, uh, Smau or Smo. I think that the uh, I think that the official pronunciation of um, Executioner Smau is is Smo, but I've always said Smau because it's got an O U G H sound, which in English is usually an Ow. Um, which actually <laughs> Smuff. Really fascinating. Um, footage of defeating that boss, call that a smuff film. Yeah, slough. Um, or sloth. Oh, well, see, I've always pronounced that as slough rather than a sloth, which is what some people pronounce it as. So that itself is, is um, divisive. So the black eye orb quivering is going to be relevant in a second, by which I mean a bit later. I hate fighting these guys. <laughs> so these are upgraded versions of the Sentinels. Um, unlike the Sentinels we fought previously, these ones have spells and are bigger and tougher. Actually, they might be the same size, but they're tougher. Um, they have the same shield ability, but in addition, they can heal themselves and also cast... Uh, a uh, faith spell which knock, which does big knockback, which is this spell. So my goal here is going to be to kill these guys, open the door, go rest at the bonfire, level up, and then come back and use the black eye item that I mentioned. Oh, hello, linguist fight, linguist fight, linguist fight. Place your bets now. Who's going to win? Probably the most cunning one. Right. So that's this one down. They're not necessarily difficult to fight. They have the same moveset for the most part. Uh, but they do have those spells that are just irritating and they do have more hit points. And maybe they move a bit faster, but I don't think so. Once again, the trick is to just like get inside that shield and be ready to dodge. Um, 
these are one of those enemies that are easier to fight in melee because uh, dodging is so critical to not dying. <laughs> and, um... Well, that's me dead. Uh, what was I saying? Well, they're difficult to fight as a sorcerer because... Oh, interesting. Gravelord Servant. So this is a covenant that I still can't remember how it works. Um, one of the many, many covenants in the game. One I haven't talked about very much so far. But the, the Gravelord Servant uh, curses every world in their orbit. Because the... the I, I don't know remember what the official term is, but... The way that multiplayer works in this is that other worlds are sort of connected temporarily. I think mechanically the best way to describe it is that like effectively what's happening is that people are randomly sort of joined together in servers uh, and you sort of drift from server to server and people are grouped up and then sort of those groups fade into other groups. So you are around the same players for a while, you know, you see the same people at bonfires sometimes. Um, if the if someone is Gravelord Servant, then I believe that um, the other people who are in their orbit get cursed in some way. There's there's a, there's some kind of downside, there's some kind of unpleasantness it causes. And um, the only way to get rid of that is to invade their world, kill them, and end the curse. And once that's happened, it's ended for everybody uh, in the zone. Everybody who is in the current orbit. Ah, okay, finally, an explanation. They infect your world with Black Phantom NPC enemies using Eyes of Death, and they leave their signature for you to kill them to clear it. Yeah, so that's uh, a good explanation of how it works. I remember looking up how it worked way back in the day and getting these really complicated explanations that didn't make any sense to me. Um, so I guess that that is the real answer, so that's good to hear. Oh, yeah, I, I've never seen them in a, in a game. I don't play New Game Plus very often. Um, can you give me something easy, please? Easy, pleasey, lemon squeezy. Because if I fail a parry again, he's going to kill me. There we go. Uh, so, yeah, you can invade them, which is interesting because covenants usually have you invading other people for reasons, whereas this is sort of the, the reverse. You can invite people to invade you. which is less aggressive. Except that becoming cursed with black phantoms in your world is probably a pain in the ass. I wouldn't know, never having seen one, because... Well, I don't play New Game Plus very much, and neither does anyone else. Because uh, the majority of the people who play these games um, seem to play... What do you call it? Uh, wait, where did I die? There I died. Seem to play... Oh, I always forget, I need to go kill that guy first, because otherwise he'll shoot me while I fight these. Yeah, people either play through, like, a single-player game and then move on, or they get into the PvP. And the people who get into the PvP usually um, settle on, like, pre-design a build and then play their character in such a way that they don't level past that build because then they're invading people who are the same level as them. There's kind of, like, a, a conception of the, like, agreed-upon best level to be PvPing at. Lots of people don't subscribe to that, but um, many, many, many do. didn't even put his shield up. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what like causes the AI to behave sensibly or non-sensibly. Can I hit that guy with a heavy soul arrow? As I've said, it's a great opener if you can fire it from where someone can't get you. I really need to get some great heavy soul arrows to just absolutely wreck bosses with. That one's seen me. Ah, uh, the animation time is a bit too long, otherwise I could have arced that around the corner. should hit. Nope. I believe these shields are unique in that they never actually, they don't need to be raised to block. They're just sort of always raised by default. Well, this is less than ideal. I'll tell you what, I'm actually gonna run over here. They're actually really easy to snipe because their shields don't cover their heads, so you can, uh, if you position yourself somewhere where you can see them and they can't get to you, like up at the top of this staircase, 
not this, but the next level up. Uh, you could just ping them in the heads endlessly and they die. Um, that's a sneaky way to get past the ones at the, the opening. Can I hit him? Am I fast enough? Yes, there we go. Oh, earlier I was talking about other games I think I'll stream once I finish this run. Because I like to have a, a game that is my main game to stream. Um, so, Dark Souls 2 is on the list. I think the original Deus Ex will be on the list as well, because I really want to let's play Deus Ex, the original Deus Ex, but it's too long of a game uh, for my self-imposed rules. Which means that I would probably best manage it with a let's play. Something else I'm thinking of is that I would like to do a, like, 50 sub- well, <laughs> I'd like to do a 100 sub uh, Twitch follower special, but that's gonna take a really long time to happen, uh, cause channel growth is slow when you're me. And uh, what I was thinking for that would be that I might do a, a marathon stream where I play through Mirror's Edge all in one sitting. Because it's one of my favourite games, and it's one of the most viable ones for that. And I believe someone just followed me, which is nice. So hi to whoever you are. Although my follow account hasn't gone up, so who knows? But I definitely heard the noise that means someone followed me. So thank you for the follow, I appreciate it. And if we get to either a hunt, <laughs> let's say a hundred for now, but if it takes fucking forever, I'll probably just say 50 subscribe, well not subscribe, but 50 follower special. I hate that all the different websites have different names for what it means to like keep track of someone. Because Twitch followers are like the same as YouTube subscribers, but Twitch subscribers means that they're like paying for the privilege of your channel or something. So yeah, um, I, I definitely think I will do a, a marathon stream. It'd probably be about five hours long, because it's not a very long game. Oh, finally. Get wrecked. The one upside to these guys is that they drop Titanite chunks, which are a bit hard to get hold of otherwise. Oh, well, you've clearly just not been visiting the, the right kinds of pubs. There's a pub here in Aberdeen called Slane's Castle that I'm very fond of. Um, because it is <laughs> themed around Dracula and inspired by the real-life Slane's Castle, which was the inspiration to Bram Stoker for Castle Dracula. <clears throat> so, um, it's this, it's this uh, big old gothic pub built in a, uh, desanctified church. I think, <laughs> I don't know what the term is, I assume desanctified is fine. And, um... It's uh, really cool. It might be closing down now, though. COVID has changed a lot of cool things in Aberdeen. Not that there's much that's cool in Aberdeen. Um, I feel like once I've lived here for four years, I'm allowed to be like, wow, this place kind of sucks a bit. Much like the locals. Uh, uh, not The locals don't suck. The locals are nice, but the place sucks is what I'm getting at. So, um, I think probably I will work my way back to the bonfire over here which is where I'm heading and that will be the end for tonight because my voice is getting about a bit sore and at the moment I am planning only to stream for two hours until I get my energy back up. I mean there are more cool people than just me in Aberdeen is what I'm getting at uh, and I'm not just saying that in case my neighbours can hear through the walls but yeah so like there's there's a really cool pub in Aberdeen called Slane's Castle uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that Oh, to go to a cool pub. Um, it's 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 cool socially as well. It's where the big, uh, like the city's big D and D club meets, because uh, the entire upper floor is like this split level balcony. Unfortunately, it needs refurbishment. It's it's gotten pretty gross in there. They, you know, there's when the pub was like designed that way, it was clearly like a lot of love went into making it look very on theme. So there's glass cases full of you know vampire hunting accoutrement, and there's creepy portraits on the walls um, and like big gothic leather bound chairs and all of that kind of stuff. I think the bathroom doors are uh, incorporated into bookcases so they're like secret doorways. Um, it's a pretty cool place but it's it's very run down at this point. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the D&D &D club lives uh, is based there and uh, well I say D&D &D club, role playing club in general. They actually play a lot of other systems which is cool because uh, it can be hard to find games for rarer systems. Anyway, here we are back at this resting place. So finally we've made it through Anor Londo. I seem to be averaging about one game zone per uh, per stream at the moment. 
so I'm going to level up. Where do we want to put some points? Let's get intelligence up to... Uh, don't quite have enough for 36. I've got... I need 15,000 to get 36, which will let me equip Soul Spear, which will do absolute fuck tons of damage. Do I have enough souls? I'm not going to use the core of an iron golem because I don't want the items you can make with it. So let's pop that. That's 12. So I need a few more. Soul of a hero, I think, is 5,000. Oh, it's 10. Okay. Well, I should probably pop another one then and just... So that it doesn't go to waste. Uh, yeah, that should be enough. So, one more into intelligence, and then let's put the other one in... Uh, I know I was making fun of endurance earlier, but it does it does help to have some. Uh, let's put it in vitality, though. I want to get to 20 vitality. So, let's not forget to attune the magic, because I always do. Fantastic. That should be a very effective build to take into the boss fight. So... Yeah, that's going to be all from me for today. Um, if there's anyone watching who doesn't already know, these streams are every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 7pm UK time. Follow me on Twitter if you want related announcements. Please go check out my YouTube channel. I do much more carefully planned, in-depth Let's Plays. Um, and thank you so much to my Patreon patrons, uh, who are a cool bunch of people. So yeah, that's going to be everything. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you on Wednesday, hopefully. Bye!